Welcome to day two of the Deep Learning Intensive Workshops. Uh, in our last uh, time together uh, on day one, we had an overview of deep learning in general and then transformer models in particular. We also had an opportunity to take a look at Hugging Face, which is a combination of data sets and um, models. What am I forgetting here? So I have models and I have, I have data sets and I have models. What else do you have to have for, uh, for transformer-based models that, that are dealing with language in LP? What's, what, what's missing? Can they work directly on text? Do you have to do something to the text first? Hmm. Okay, great. Tokenizers. That's right. So it's data, tokenizers, and models. And recall that the tokenizers and the models need to go together because it's actually doing figuring out a substitution for subword divisions. And you're going to see that in the examples today, in the real world examples that you're going to be running today, how tokenizers split words into subwords. Uh, we, we talked about how these actually run and the different ways that you can use them. Uh, you recall that, that one way uh, just used uh, uh, the model as is. So you take a, a, a basic model, you take a tokenizer or a basic model, and you just run it. And there are some pre-prepared models that are ready to do things like question answering, like categorization, like sentiment analysis, and those are ready to run out of the box. You know, it's very defined in what they do. They've already been trained. They are already really good language models and, and you can do uh, basic things. So for question answering, all you gotta do is, is the, the text on which you wanna answer the questions. No training, no additional training. This is what's called zero shot. Uh, two years ago, this was shocking. Two years ago, this was insane that you could even have a model that could do zero shot. Now it's like, huh? Do I want to do the zero shot or do, you want to, do I want to do a little bit of additional training? Yeah, I can sort of decide. So just know that the world changed uh, just before you got on this, this, this bus. The other thing, of course, that's available is that you can use these models and do additional work. So you recall that you had that transformer-based model and then it produced, what, what did it produce? Do you all recall what we call that? Transformer-based models that did it did the tokenizing and then you had the encoding and then it produced, what was, it, what was its output before we put anything else there? Yes, it was a hidden layer, absolutely. And what could you get out of that hidden layer? Isn't that where you could get another model where, that you could actually do your, the classification or the sentiment analysis or whatever, right? You take yeah. those to do whatever your final task was. Yes. Right? So you can put another model there because what it gives you is features. It does feature extraction. Mm -hmm. So, and as we talked about, even those features are really quite rich and valuable in and of themselves. You can analyze those directly to see how the features change over time, for example. Uh, or you can put another model there and do things like uh, answer questions. And the way that you do that is you put a decoder on those, uh, those features, which then turn it back into words. Uh, or you can do classification, or you can do sentiment analysis. Any of those things, it's all fair game. You recall that, again, you could use that frozen all the way through where you just run it, or you could do some additional training on that later model. So you could do some additional training on the model, let's say, which did a classification for you, or you could go whole hog, go all the way back and do training all the way back through the transformer as well. So, and, and get even, even better results. But there was an issue. Why would you not want to just always go back and do training all the way through the transformer model? Why might you, even if you want to do training, only do training up to that level of that classification model or whatever model you have at the very end. Yeah, Sam, you're right. It's expensive. 
These are very, very high parameter models. It can be expensive to, to train. There are certain types of models that you'll see that actually are smaller and, and cheaper to train. But yeah, it takes a lot of GPU time. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a large GPU. Well, one thing that I want to share with you now is that the Data Science Institute has purchased two extremely powerful AI machines. They're called NVIDIA DGX A100s. These are some of those powerful machines that you can buy to do deep learning. And we're gonna be making them available to researchers on the Vanderbilt University campus who would like to train these types of models. So if you find yourself in a position where you do want to do additional heavy duty training on these models, know that we have some fantastic equipment on which you can do that. And we have compute grants uh, that, uh, uh, that, we, that we grant uh, so you can do this type of work. That was actually one of the reasons why we wanted to do this workshop now. We wanted to be able to get people prepared, such as yourself, who are gonna be making the best possible use of these compute resources. So know that as you do your work and as you may try to do a transform, uh, transform model frozen, and you begin to think, gosh, what's possible if I could actually unfreeze and do training all the way back? Know that we have equipment that we can do that on. So I'll give more details on this a little bit later on, closer to the end of the workshop, but uh, just wanted to let you all know we have it and y'all are gonna be first in line because you all have taken the time to actually learn, prepare, and to know how to use this equipment. All right. Any questions? When do we get the goodies? When did they show up? Uh, they are on their way. They need to be on the dock by, by July 1, uh, and they should be. Then the question is going to be actually getting them hooked up. Uh, <laughs> when, when we told Acre what we were getting, they were like, seriously? <laughs> it requires its own power supply, like its own huge wall-mounted power supply to get these things to run, but they're doing it for us and they're getting us set up. So uh, we will be keeping you all informed about when that compute becomes available. And how is this impacting uh, Vanderbilt being carbon neutral by 2021, Jesse? Uh, it, it's, um, it's, <laughs> it could be. Um, it, is, it is the equivalent of, of jamming eight of the most spectacular gaming rigs you could possibly buy, cramming eight of them into a single box, making them share all of their video memory. So most video cards have four gigabytes of RAM. The, the good ones have like six gigabytes of RAM. When you run models on this one, you have 320 gigabytes of video RAM to train on. Most cards have 256 cores. You'll have 64,000 GPU cores to do training on. So it's not helping. Uh, <laughs> so next we need the funding for solar panels on top of our building. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. I'm planting a tree. Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, but it's really serious stuff. But yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Any other questions? All right. Dr. Bell, was I supposed to address anything else? No, but I think you did a great job of addressing all those things. So thank you so much for all that. Right. All right, fantastic. Well, today, as Jesse was saying, we're gonna have a hands-on exploration into some of Honey Face's functionality with pipelines. And so, so if you don't know me, um, I'm Sharo Bell, I'm the senior data scientist um, but Jesse, as you know, is here, our chief data scientist to help out um, with any of the things that you run into, like when you're coding um, or when you're trying to use Google Colab. And also Preston Abraham, our intern, is here to help as well. So we're all three of us doing this together to help you guys out. Um, so please feel to ask any of us any questions. Uh, it's really a team effort here. <laughs> okay, um, so let's see. You know it's me. Anytime you see me pop up, you can always just think, oh Lord, she's gonna shove all this information down our throats. We're not gonna be able to drink a nice sip of water from the fire hydrant. Sorry about that. Again, please feel free to always slow me down, ask questions. Um, and today is gonna be very, very exciting. We're gonna have our first foray into coding on Google Colab using pipelines um, for inference. So oh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. So again, we're going to be using some of the built-in models today uh, for whatever task of interest. So we discussed some of the tasks that are available um, yesterday. So whether it's classification or summarization, name entity recognition, whatever. 
Um, then we're going to try it on some data in our own repository. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means that today you're going to see what a full, a full workflow might look like using Google Colab. Um, we'll look at how what this means for the organization of your data if you want to use Google Colab um, as your computational platform. And then we'll probably have the opportunity to talk more about Model Hub. Jesse introduced fine tuning yesterday. He talked about it a little bit just then. We'll introduce a little bit more about what that might look like, um, but that's something that we'll really jump into tomorrow. Lastly, we're gonna assign you some homework so that you'll be able to start using your own data, hopefully with the pipelines tomorrow. Um, well, let's see. If you don't need to fine tune, you should still learn about it. Um, it'll probably be helpful in your future work, but um, join us tomorrow anyways. Okay, so let's just go ahead and jump right into some Hugging Face resources. And by the way, we're going to be using lots of different references and resources today on Hugging Face's website. So if you just see me like switching between tabs and going back and forth, please feel free to ask me like, what was that that you were just looking at? What tab was that one? Can you post the link again? So don't get lost. Don't feel, don't like be afraid to speak up. Uh, we're here to help and to learn today. Um, again, we ask questions or you have questions, drop them in the chat, feel free to unmute and uh, let's get it popping. Okay, so let's see. All right, so we're gonna start with some Hugging Face resources. Uh, oh, I guess I should share my screen. So I'm actually gonna share you this great resource that Hugging Face has. Oh, and that kind of pasted in the chat in an unfortunate way. Okay, there we go. So if you guys shimmy on over there with me, let me just go ahead and open that myself and I'll share my screen so we can all kind of look together. Oh, let me see, let's make this a little bigger so we can actually read. Right, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know if you don't see the right screen. So this is the Hugging Face Transformers Notebooks. This is and provides some really great resources um, on understanding what's going on and implementing some things using Hugging Face. So if you get lost or you're confused or you want to just know a little bit more background um, about what's going on in Hugging Face or about transformers or about deep learning, this is a great set of notebooks to actually look at. Um, I would suggest um, Jesse did a great job introducing what transformers were and motivating their history and outlining what tokenizers are. If you want to look a little bit more at that, this is a really great notebook, so both of these, but this one in particular for learning about transformers is really, really nice um, to understand a little bit more about the architecture, where they came from, and where they're going. But we are going to jump right into this pipelines notebook, so this one. If you click on it, you're actually going to end up in the repo. So what we're going to do is we are going to open this in Colab. So just click on this blue button here and it should open this for you in Colab. So let's click that one. So quick, quick question. So if you click on the link to the left, it just opens you up into GitHub. But if you click on open in Colab, then it opens it actually ready to, to run. Is that right? And that is such a great point. So this is opening it on Colab, which is meaning that uh, you actually have this computational backend where you're able to write Python code, use transformers, use pipelines on a computational engine. And something that's actually interesting here is that you're able to change your runtime type once you connect. Um, and so you can actually run this on some GPUs as well, which is pretty exciting. Um, let's see. So yesterday we talked about um, some of the tasks that are available to us. You guys kind of talked about some of the ones that you might find interesting. This notebook introduces some of the tasks um, specifically with natural language processing, but not all of them. So as you know, and Jesse has said, this is an ever evolving um, framework. And so some of the things that are available through pipelines right now actually aren't implemented. And so you might try that on today. Anyways, just to do a quick overview, uh, just reviewing some of the tasks that are available. We can do some uh, sentiment analysis to understand whether the sentiment expressed from a task is, or from some text is positive or negative. We can do some name entity recognition. I know that some of you are interested in that. Um, question answering, we can provide a question and provide some context. And you should think about this as maybe extractive question answering where some conceptual relation between um, the question and the text actually exists. 
mass filling. Um, this is filling a word um, with, uh, so basically a fill in the blank uh, provided by the model. We can also do text summarization. So if we have some super duper long text and we want it to be a paragraph, um, text summarization models will be able to assist with this. We also have translation from one language to another. And as Jesse was telling us about before, feature extraction, which will help us understand the features represented by our tokenized text. Okay. So you can learn a little bit more about pipelines here, what exactly is going on. So we have a lot of different steps. Jesse told us about tokenization, where we're going to take that text, we're going to take the literal ASCII letters, and we're going to con convert them into, into tokens, um, as well as some other parts um, of the text. We're also going to map the tokens into a meaningful exp uh, exp uh, expression or representation, and then we're going to actually apply the text um, if that's what our task is asking. Something really important to note here is, so this is not code that you can run, um, but it is kind of showing you what things tend to look like. So when you create a pipeline, you usually call it with the task name and you'll get the model and tokenizer. You can specify in this argument, the specific model that you want. Uh, Charles, could you zoom in just a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. It's funny because actually I can barely do <laughs> I can barely see it and it's my screen. I was like squinting. <laughs> Thank you. Is this better? Bigger? Smaller? I'd say one, I'd say one one or two more. Okay. Let's do this one. All right. Is this one better? Okay. Is that, good. Is that good for people? Okay, good. Oh, great. Yeah, I don't know what I was doing. I was like, what does that say? Okay, great. <laughs> All right. And then our last layout, we can also pass in not just the model, but also the tokenizer. Okay, so what is what does that mean? Well, let's give it a try. So the first thing we kind of talked about was that we need to have transformers available to us, right? So it's not like by default installed into like our environment to just be imported. We actually have to pip install it. So um, again, this is Colab. To run this, you can click this arrow. So that's going to pip install this. This is just saying, okay, Google didn't make this. You're trying to run something. Just see if it's going to interact with your data. So we're going to run anyway. So this is again installing the transformers package. So here you can see that it is installing some things here. See that it's running and now it is executed. Um, we'll come back to what this exclamation point is. It's very except well, we don't have to. So this is basically a bash command. So this is not running like specifically Python. The exclamation point says, hey, I need to like run this as if it's a bash command in a bash terminal. So this is something that you would normally run in a bash terminal. Um, and if you if we had this pro access, we'd be able to do it as well. But we don't. Maybe you do, but I don't. Okay, so now we've installed, installed this. Um, we also need to now import the things that we want. So this is a little bit of a special notebook because it allows you to do some different things. So that's what these two are. They're doing something just a little bit special. Um, but otherwise, you would always want to imp, uh, import pipeline from the Transformers package. So this is going to import this particular module um, from Transformers, which we just installed. So let's run that one. All right, that's looking good. You might also see me execute this by clicking Shift Enter. Um, so if you just see this like randomly start running, it's because I clicked Shift Enter, but that is the equivalent of clicking era. So we today are going to ex experiment with and experience these different tasks. And so we're going to learn more about the API while we are investigating these tasks. And so what, what am I saying? So the thing is, with Hugging Face and with APIs, like we could not just teach every single like piece of minutia about this API uh, in the next set of workshops and it would it would actually be more beneficial for you to be able to learn to examine the api and extract the information from it that you need so then as you go along things will be more extensible for you if you find that you need to you know augment the specific capability you know how to use the apis to access that information so that's what we're going to be looking at today so for that purpose i'm actually let's see let's grab the breakout room document would someone mind uh Jesse or Preston, would you mind dropping the link to the breakout room document in the chat? Let's yeah. see. I'm trying to find it myself. Where did I put that? Yeah. For oh, thank you. Oh, and, and quick, uh, quick question. 
should people change their run times to GPU? So if you'd like to, you can certainly change your runtime to GPU. The way that you do that is you go to runtime and then change runtime type. With the hardware accelerator, you can use either of these things. So here we have the GPU. Colab also will allow you to use the TPUs. And, and the TPUs, by the way, are a tensor processing unit. Uh, they, they actually do tensors, so they do matrix, like direct matrix multiplication for, for smaller matrices and can vastly speed you up. But for inferencing should be faster. And certainly if you're ever doing anything with training, then you do want to use the GPU because you'll, you'll definitely want to have that. And also do know that um, if you're sort of interested in more, you know, longer run times and a little bit better GPU compute or maybe higher memory, uh, you can also do Colab Pro, which is about 10 bucks a month, uh, or you can be on, on Acre, but Colab's nice because it's sort of roll it, you know, start it up and go. All right, so I'm just going to jump into this breakout room document right quick so you all can know what we're going to do in our breakout rooms in just a moment. So we're going to start by exploring the APIs kind of together. Um, and then you will do some on your own. So let's see, I think we're in here. Questions for all rooms. Okay, good. And I'm going to make this a little bigger because again, even I can't see this. Ah, we're going to make it in the front. All right, so let's just move this out the way because it's going to annoy me. And, you know, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to split the screen. So we'll see how that goes. Let me know if you can't see stuff. All right, so. Wow. All right, is this okay? Can y'all see this? Okay, both of these, okay. All right, so what are we trying to find out? So this is going to be the breakout room. I mean, obviously, this is the breakout room document. So everyone will be answering these particular questions. OK, right. So this will be applicable to everyone. And then depending on which uh, room or which task that you're interested in, you will answer these specific questions um, to your room. OK, so we're going to do the sentence classification one together. I'm actually just going to go ahead and grab this. So I probably should have went ahead and did this, but I didn't. All right. So what does it say? Try out your assigned pipeline. What is being downloaded? What? Okay, let's see. So this is the one that we're working on, sentence classification. Let me just scroll down so you can see this. What is being downloaded? So let's run this. So we're running this now. Oh, this one didn't appreciate that. Just a moment. And there we go. So I'm on the CPUs. <laughs> this might just run like this for downloads on the CPUs kind of slowly, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, if anyone tried out the GPUs, let me know if it's faster and how much faster it is. So this is downloading some things, right? So part of what is downloading are, is gonna be the models and the tokenizers. And we can read that also in our API. So let's see, it seems like it's downloading. Models and okay, it's and we'll, only, and we'll only need to download the models once. Remember all the stuff that pipeline is doing for you in the background. So it's actually loading up everything in all the models. But then after that point, then it's really fast. Yep, exactly. So explain the behavior or outputs of the inference. Okay, so we were supposed to be doing sentiment analysis. If we passed in, so just to decompose a little bit, what this is. So this is the pipeline argument, which we're using to create the pipeline. This is the pipeline task that we're passing in. After we do that, it, uh, it uses the default model that it has, and it downloads that one, and then that's stored into this NLP sentence class object, so this variable. Then with this variable, we use the call argument. OK, so you're going to see that in the API. And we pass in this particular argument, which is the text that we're using. Okay. All right. So then, okay, let's look. So what is the behavior and output of the inference? Well, we passed in this thing and we wanted to get the sentiment. 
So what does it return? It actually returns the sentiment. So whether positive or negative as a dictionary and the sentiment is given by the key label and the score confidence is given by the score. So that is something that we can write in our results notebook as we're working along. Um, the model returns the, uh, a list of labels, a list of dictionaries where the keys are label, which is going to be whether the sentiment was positive or negative, and the score, which is the probability. I think that is the probability for this one. Okay, so what model is being used? Does anybody see on here what model is being used? How in the world can we find that out? Hard, hard. Well, people who attended the Python workshop, so I'm about to do something here. I'm gonna click on this and I'm gonna pick B. Okay, so that just gave me a cell below. So people who attended the Python workshop, people who attended the Python workshop, we said that when we were talking about object-oriented programming, okay, so objects can have properties and methods Right. So how did we say that we could look at some of the properties or methods? Does anybody remember, especially on Google Colab? Anyone feeling brave? Again, just feel free to drop it in the chat. Marcus, you have a really great idea. Oh, it's a great idea. <clears throat> Oh, oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about that help, but now I kind of want to try the help. Okay, um, I might come back to that one. That's very interesting. But I was just thinking about using the dot. So I tend to investigate what attributes and methods are available to me just by using the dot. So NLP, sentence class, because that's the name of our object. And then I just type dot. And then I start looking. Mm. Now, Sometimes it's not helpful, but sometimes it is. And sometimes it also helps just to know like what's available and what to look at. Um, for me, if I was guessing and I wanted to know what the model type is, I might just use this model. So let's see, model, let's try that one. Goes on there. Hmm, wow, it has a lot to say about what kind of model it is. And in fact, it tells you exactly, literally it tells you exactly what kind of model it is. And it is a distilbert for sequence classification. So that's the class. And then this is the actual layout of the model itself. Interesting. You know what's really funny? That is the model. I mean, <laughs> so you remember before when I mentioned that, that when it learns, it's actually learning within the weights. So this is defining what that model looks like how the architecture actually works. And this is why it's so easy to translate now between uh, you know, these two totally different frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow, because the model definitions look like this. It's pretty exciting, pretty exciting things. So now we know that we have some type of Stilbert model. So we can just write that here, the Stilbert model particularly for sequence classification. And this is the class actually from Hugging Face. Okay, so what kind of tokenizers, oh, what kind of tokenizer is being used? What do you think, like, you guys take a look. Do you see anything here with this period that I might be able to use to figure out what kind of tokenizer it is? Oh, I can't even see. Ah, good. I like that tokenizer. So this is also a function, by the way. But anyways, maybe here, there. So tokenizer. Okay, let's see. Oh, oh, interesting. It told us some things about the tokenizer. So what is this? So it says that this is a pre-trained tokenizer fast. So if you look at the API, there are some arguments that you can use to use the fast tokenizer versus just whatever the default tokenizer is. 
this is pretty exciting. So this is actually very specific about what the path is or the name of the model and tokenizer are. So here we can use this. So a couple of interest, and do you mind? Oh, Charlie? go ahead, please. please. Okay. Um, a couple of interesting things here. First of all, you'll notice it was very specific about which model it went with. Why does it have to be very specific about which model it went with? That's right, Sam. The model and the tokenizer need to exactly match. And so it has to do that. You'll notice that this also says fast. This is distill based, uh, distill, distill Bert based, uncased, fine tuned. And then it said fast earlier. Fast means that it is a type of model that's actually been rewritten in Rust. So it's, uh, it's essentially C. Um, it's very, very fast and it has some additional capabilities. So what happens is you take these. Uh, the, the hugging face gets like the basic uh, tokenizers, but tokenization can be a very time consuming part. So they rewrite those tokenizers in, uh, in the fast format. Uh, so they actually reprogram them so they're as fast as possible. So they do a, a lot of, uh, of setup there. Final thing is you'll notice that it says distill BERT. So it's not just BERT, which is one of the big early models, it's distill BERT. And what Distillbird does is it actually takes these this big, big model with all these parameters and shrink it. Uh, sometimes they would shrink by, by, by the types of weights they allow. They just don't allow real value. They only allow integer or they, they, they have smaller representation or they go with a smaller model and they try to recover as much capability of the full model as possible. And they'll get like 95, 97% of the capability of the huge model with a much smaller model. That's often going to be the default models to distill birds because they're smaller, fit into memory, are faster, they train faster, and you only give up a little bit uh, out of the huge model that it came out of. That is good information. Good information. Okay, so let's see. Moving right along. All right, so now we get into this question. And so this was the model specific question. Can I use more than two classification labels for general text classification? How does this change the output? Huh, it's kind of hard to figure out like that doesn't seem like really a method that we could investigate or a model that we could investigate or like a property or a method that seems like something that we might need to read the API for. Hmm. Well, we can do that. So let's see. Hopefully. Oh, thank goodness. So we can actually go and take a look at the API. And so I'm just going to grab this one here. And I'm going to paste it over here. So again, hang in there with me. It's going to be a lot of tabs today. All right. So what were we trying to do? Can I use more than one classification label? All right. So what we're doing, text classification. That's what we were doing. So this is that text-specific pipeline. So let's click on that one. Hmm, that's interesting. This tells me a lot of things here. So let's see, this is a model for sequence classification. We specifically did the sentiment analysis one, interesting. It also looks like we can return multiple classification labels if we're doing this generalized sequence classification task. Okay. So can I use more than two sequence classification labels? Yes. This changes the output by running a softmax over the labels. And if there's a single label, we run a sigmoid over the results. And so that, that is just kind of describing how we get the scores. And, okay, so I see a question in the chat from Pedro. Is there information about the data the model was trained on or is it assumed it's the online universe? And we have some upvotes here. This is a great question that I love, okay? And we, so actually Marcus dropped into the chat a link to the model hub. And if you go and look on the model hub, there's something there called a model card. And often that describes the full training or a lot of the training, what it was trained on, what kind of tests were done. And a lot of that information is right on that model card. 
Um, also, there is an attribute or a property that is model card, um, but I, I haven't seen where that, like, I don't know that it always populates um, through um, Google Colab, but it is available on the model hub with Hubby Place. And we will take a look at that, which is pretty exciting in the future. Also a note on that, it's a really good question about the data the model was trained on. And uh, sometimes the answer is uh, you only have the approximate information about what they were trained on. That's true for the models from like Facebook and Google. They'll sort of characterize where the data came from, but they don't give specifics. So now there's a new international effort uh, that Hugging Face is part of and that, that we've signed on to as well, uh, which is uh, built around creating a new large language model uh, along the lights of uh, you know, Bert, Roberta uh, and GPT along those lines, but using curated data, meaning that you, you record exactly what went into it. So you keep track of everything that was used to train it so you can actually do things like uh, analyze uh, uh, a bias and other things that may uh, get into the, to the models. Great insights, yes. Okay, let's see. So we said that this has yes, and then otherwise we run, otherwise the model runs a pipeline, or sorry, runs a sigmoid, oh, sorry, it So now let's see. So let's say, so there are multiple labels that could possibly be um, uh, classified. And this by default appears to just be giving us the one, right? It just told us that the label was positive and it gave us the score. Now, what if we wanted to know the other one? Or maybe if we had multiple labels, what if we wanted to know all of their scores? Huh, I wonder if we can do that. Let's see. Well, we do know in the general setup with pipeline. So here, so calling pipeline, we can pass in these things. Model to the next model card. Framework, task, arms parser. Hmm. Yeah, this is looking device. Uh, no binary. Uh -huh. Okay. Flag indicating if the output pipeline should happen in a binary format. That's not quite it. Return all scores whether to return all prediction scores or just the one of the predicted class. I want to see all of the prediction scores. Boolean, whether to return all the prediction scores. Ah, it's and. We can see the evidence that this is false because it says it defaults to false, but we also saw that when we ran this. So therefore, we know that we can actually do this. This is not something we have to hack our way into. We don't have to struggle and try to make this work. We don't have to jump into the PyTorch. We can use this particular parameter and set it to true. So during pipeline creation, oh, wait, no, it's that, yeah, creation, we can pass return all scores equal to Okay. Let's see, thank you API. Let's see what else. All right, so this is when we actually call the model. What else do we have? Can I classify more than one text at a single time? So maybe I have a list of sentiments. Maybe I have like 12 articles and I wanna know, like I don't wanna iterate through them. I just want it to return it all to me at one time. Can I do that? Let's see, so when we call this, classify the text, it's interesting. So that's kind of a signal that maybe we can. So when we pass this in, let's see, we can pass in either a string or a list of strings. What does this say? One of several texts or one list of prompts to classify. Okay, all right, so that sounds like an answer for us. It looks like, yes, we can pass in uh, a list of prompts. All right, so that's pretty exciting. Keep in mind that it is really nice to read kind of like when you're using something, it's good to know what's available to you. Um, also, sometimes it's kind of good to read like the whole thing a little bit, especially the returns. So for example, if we're returning all scores is true. So that thing that we just talked about, we return one dictionary per return label. Um, so that would change our outputs just a little bit, but we would just need to keep that in mind. Okay. So now we are going to go into breakout rooms and repeat the same thing, except for you're gonna try 
it on the task that you're interested in. Um, and there will be, again, you want to answer all of these questions uh, for your model, for your pipeline task. And if you happen to get done, an example for zero shot classification is not in the notebook. So test your metal about implementing zero shot classification on just some demo string. Okie dokie, let's see. And I think the breakout rooms are gonna be 20 minutes. Um, and if you happen to finish quickly, come on out of the breakout rooms and we can discuss your project um, more. Or if everyone seems to be finishing pretty quickly, we'll just have another set of breakout rooms where people will be able to try a different task. All right, let me stop share. The breakout rooms are now open. You can choose the room that you would like to go in. If you're unable to choose a room, uh, it could be that you need to re uh, that you need to update your uh, your client. So if you're unable to 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 get to a room, uh, might need to log off and update your client and come back in. So what should I see? Like nothing's popping up. Does that mean I need to update my client? Like I don't, nothing's changed. Probably, yeah. If okay. there's a, it's so on the bottom, you might see breakout rooms. I'm gonna test it out, see what it looks like myself. But yeah, you may need to pop off, update yeah. your client. And the way that you have to update your client is uh, uh, you, you, you click on the, uh, on Zoom, and then you click on your picture, and then you click on check for updates. Okay. So I, I can't show uh, Zoom's on Windows, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. So on Windows, you know, you you click on your uh, icon, then you open up your Zoom window, uh -huh. click on your picture, and you say check for updates. Okay. And there's up. Oh, I have an update available. How about that? <laughs> All right. I'll see you in a bit. All right. Is everyone else kind of just deciding which breakout room to go into? If you're not sure on exactly which task you want to do, you can just pick one and give that one a try. Mm I think I missed the part about updates. I was looking at the rooms and trying to get myself into one. So I can see the breakout rooms, but I can't see how to enter one. Oh, you can't, you can't click on join, huh? It doesn't look like I have a join. Okay. Then I would say, uh, yes, go ahead and, uh, yeah, and you can do this right now. You can click on your Zoom and check and see if there's an update available. Um, Got okay. it. Yeah. Which one were you interested in? I might be able to put you in there. Um, yeah, if you can, I was going to go to summarization. Summarization. Okay. Summarization. So, uh, oh, they. Now I got the join. Okay. okay. Great. Cool. Thank you. Sorry, folks. Oh, you're welcome. See ya. And Dennis, do you need help getting into a room? I just restarted my. Um... Oh, good. So let's see. All right, and Peter, do you need help getting into a uh, room? And just to let me know if you don't see it, and I can also put you into the room. Yeah, so I mean, I can pull up the breakout rooms and see them, but I don't see a way to join one. Is it like, that, like a join button? Is that what it would look like? Yes. 
So uh, in a gray bar with the names of them, there should be a join, like a blue join. So if you see like summarization, all oh, the I see it now. I, I had to mouse over the number. Ah, uh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Excellent. All right. And uh, Peter, are you, uh, uh, do you need to be put it? Oh, Peter's gone. Oh, okay. All right. Everyone's in. Uh, we can pause the recording, I suppose. Welcome back from the break. You have missed nothing at all. Dr. Bell. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, no. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to point out was just with the zero shot classification pipeline leading, reading this part a little bit. When you start implementing things, so kind of what we're going to talk about later today with fine tuning it tomorrow, uh, just take a look at what this says. So, for example, this might say this classification pipeline. So this class, you can use a, whatever this is, trained on NLI, natural language inference tasks. The models that this pipeline can use are models that have been fine tuned on an NLI task, okay? So whenever you start trying to do fine tuning and when you start using models, which we will look at today, keep these types of things in mind. So this class that is available and then the models that have been fine tuned on the task and whether that is necessary for the specific kind of task that you're using. So for example, if you were to go and to look at the feature extraction, it might not say that. It might say something completely different because you're trying to use the base of the encoder part with the hidden layer, okay? All right, so with that, you have now implemented a few pipelines. You have learned how to investigate and examine the API to implement pipelines. And we're gonna take a brief five minute break, but when you come back, we are going to learn how to use data um, on Google Drive to actually uh, do inference using these pipelines, but with real data, okay? All right, so five minute break. I guess we'll be back at 11, let's speak at 1119. You sure you want to do eleven twenty? Just round it. Yeah, let's round it eleven twenty. Perfect. Great. All right. See y'all in a few. It may be worthwhile when we talk more about the uh, the training too, to talk about uh, what you just touched on too. What can change? The tokenizer can change. They so can change your dictionary. You can, you can expand that too. You can uh, 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 train on additional text, but you can also train on a different pretext, you know, and, and sort of, you know, separating that out from the later model, which is doing the classification with the earlier model, which has the pretext task, sort of just putting that in people's minds. Anyway. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. I'll see you.
our way back for the rest of the workshop for the second half. Or not half, the second portion. All right, welcome back, welcome back. All right, well, just to update you after our five minute break. So we've had a bit, little bit of experience just then using the APIs and the dummy data that we typed in. So the actual strings that we wrote in that specific moment. But how can you use your own data on Google Colab um, for your own projects to do inference? Well, one of the ways that you can do this is through mounting your own drive onto Google Colab and use the data as you would normally on your computer. So in the following example that we're gonna do, we're gonna do this together. So we're gonna start with the repo, we're gonna open it up using Google Colab, and then we're gonna take a specific set of steps. Um, we're gonna clone the repo onto Google Drive. And then keep in mind that you don't actually have to do that step. The reason that we're doing that step is so that you will have access to all the files and we'll all have the same file set because they're currently stored in the repository. But any of the individual steps that you see, you'll be able to do yourself uh, to mount your Google Drive and access your specific files. Okay, so let's see. Let me should send you the link to the repo that we'll be using. Just gonna drop that into the chat. Oh, formatted in a way that I can like. Okay, there you go. And I'm just gonna open that same thing up on my computer and then share my screen. I'm also going to open it in two tabs just for reference. Let's get there. Let's get there. For some reason, this is not working for the web. There we go. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so here's the repo. Hopefully you all were able to access, access it. It's public, so you should be able to jump right in. Um, before we get into the actual collab part, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on here. So if you need, so if you have some sort of private data that you cannot up to, up, upload to the cloud or put into Google Drive or something like that, these are a few instructions about how you can install Anaconda um, on your local computer so that you'll be able to use your files. Um, also, Jesse talked a little bit about earlier that we have some grants that are available for uh, processing um, through Acre. So let us know about that. The second thing is, um, so this is kind of what we just went over. It just has some links to the pipeline notebook that we went over. These two are what we'll be using today. So in case you get a little bit lost and you might want to stop us today if you get lost here, here are the actual solutions. So for what we go over today, but we are going to be sitting in this notebook too. So again, if you click on this, it's just going to show you the code in the repo. Um, we are going to actually go to this open and collab batch. However, before we get here, we talked about using our own data, right? And so the data that we're going to use today is text data, and it's right here in this workshop files directory. So if you click on that, you can see the text. Um, and for example, if we click on this text, you can see that there is text. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is dark, this is internet quote, but uh, the, this is an example of, of some text you might find in there. Uh, let's see, oh, lastly, we have a CSV file. Um, the example that we have here, and I'll explain a little bit later, is that maybe the researcher is trying to understand the sentiments um, of particular authors. All of these are the articles that have been written in this author data CSV. You can click on it to see it a little bit. It has all the information about the authors, maybe a little bit of you know, metadata related to them. And what we're trying to understand is whether their college major influences the sentiments of their uh, articles. And the article ID, which corresponds to the text in that workshops files um, directory that you saw is given here, okay? All right, so now going back to this, let's go ahead and open this up in Google Colab. So we're just gonna click on this little badge here. Okay, and then this should open up and we are going to open this two drive data inference. 
So we're just going to go ahead and click on that. All right, so here we go. All right, so things to look at in this uh, screen or this environment is this set of tabs over here. They're actually like super helpful. So this one is just gonna give you a brief overview of the notebook. These are all the headings and how they are kind of set up. This one is quite interesting because it enables you to browse the files that are connected to your run pack. So we said that we really, really wanted to mount our Google Drive, right? And so once we have mounted our Google Drive, this will allow us to view them. So there are several ways that one can mount a Google Drive. One is just through clicking this button and it will perform that behavior for you or it will drop some code in that you will then run. But we also have that right here. So we are going to click this button to mount the Google Drive uh, and it's going to go with the Google account that you're currently logged in with. So I think that's my variable account maybe, but we'll see. So we're going to click this button. Again, it's just importing some uh, the Python files so that you'll be able to mount the drive. So let's mount it. So this is going to ask us, so we're going to run that, but this is going to ask us for some things. So it wants you to authorize that, uh, that Colab is able to access your Google Drive. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna to go to this URL. So click on that, it's gonna open in another window. It's gonna give you an authorization code. And then you're gonna copy that authorization code and paste it here, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen while I do that. Um, but if you have any problems with that, please let us know. All right. So raise, uh, put a red X if you need uh, some assistance. All right, let's see. All right, and in your reactions tab, would you mind putting up a green check mark if you were able to do that? Um, let's see. Oh, sorry, you might need to put that in there again. Just to make sure. And if you want us to pause a little bit, put up a red X or a slow down signal. We can make sure that everyone is able to access. And we're happy to open breakout rooms in case that you're not able to get this working. This is a really um, important step if you want to be able to access things through Google Drive. So one final check, go ahead and put up a red X if you would like to have some assistance and we can pop into a room. Could you have mounted a subfolder of Google Drive? Not sure, that's something that we'll have to look into. That would certainly be nice. Ooh. I think through looking at maybe at this API, we might be able to investigate that a little bit more. Yeah. Also in that one notebook, I believe, maybe it's this notebook, ah, it's this notebook. So here are some, uh, so this is Google Colab's notebook about doing IO. And so you can take a look at that one and see if they have any more information there. Okay, it looks like we're all together. Good. So here you can actually see something interesting. So I didn't have this drive one before, right? But now I have it. So what's in there? So now you get to see all the things that I ever had. So here is my drive. Here are all my directories. So this is my Google Drive. Oops, and I have already cloned this, so that might fail for me. I wonder if I can just kind of delete this. Oh, nope, I can't. So you're going to see something fail here. It's going to try to uh, reclone that, but that's okay. 
you just keep uh, doing that that step. Okay, so now that we've uh, mounted this, now we can go into the drive. So into your directory. And that's what this CD drive does. Keep in mind that when you're trying to CD um, on Google Drive or Google Colab, you need to have this percent symbol instead of the exclamation point. Um, this is something that appears to be specific to Jupyter Notebooks. So this line right here will get your current directory to be within my drive. So here, our next step is going to start with an exclamation point. This is again saying, hey, I'm a bash command, execute me bashfully, bashishly, bash shelly. And so that will allow us to clone the repo directly into our drive. At that point, we're just going to CD right into the intensive. So that's just like when you're on your computer and you open up a file directory and then you find the directory that you want to be in. Once you're in there, you can do all of the operations relative to that particular file. So again, changing into our directory. So into our drive, this one, cloning the repo onto that drive, right? Then stepping into that folder. So you run this as such. I'm actually just going to comment this out, went out for myself because I forgot to delete that yesterday. Hopefully it contains the same thing. All right, so you should see some extra things here where it does uh, the git behavior of enumerating the objects and cloning. Um, if that did not work for you, go ahead and put up a red X. All right, it looks like we're on the ball. All right, things are looking good. All right, now our stuff is mounted. We have the, the, the information that we need. We have the files. Keep in mind, again, you might already have the files on your drive that you want. All you would have needed to do would have been to just mount this and do the file map. That's it. Otherwise, we could just keep moving forward. So now, just like we did before on the other notebook, we'll pip install transformers. Just like we did before, it's grabbing the packages here. Again, exclamation point says, hey, let's do some bash stuff. You can see it's doing some bash stuff. We uh, got what we wanted. And now we're going to actually start with the work that we're trying to do. So again, our objective here is really to understand the sentiments um, expressed by authors with different college majors. Okay, so now we're just going to start on that. It's like we normally do with our analysis. We're going to start with all of our imports. So all of our data science stuff, pa uh, pandas, numpy, seaboard. Glob is a really awesome file helper. If you were in the Python uh, workshop, we did this a little bit differently, but you'll see how to use Glob today with Google Drive. And then we're also going to import transformers as we normally do. So let's run that one. All right, we are making it, making it. Okay, so that's looking good. Let's see, this just gives a little bit more information about the example scenario, um, trying to understand sentiments of authors with college majors. Okay, so now. How do we get the files that we're trying to work with? How do we access them? Well, again, because of the way, because we have cloned the repo and the directory is set up so that it's a subdirectory, we can look in the subdirectory that we're in. So we are here. We can look at the subdirectory and enumerate all the text files that we're looking for, right? So the way that we can do that is use glob and pass in the string, which contains mostly exactly what we're looking for. So this is, we're looking in workshop files, and then we pass in this wildcard, which means, hey, whatever matches here, match it, and it's gonna end with .txt. So let's see what that returns. We're gonna store that into a variable called file name. So let's see what that returns. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So these are all the text files that we have in the repo, or yeah, well, in that directory, and again, just to remind you, if this would have been an avalanche or in Bayesian, I could have used a different file path here to match that. So if your files are somewhere in one of these directories, you can just use uh, the directory name here, maybe a CD depending where you are, and or not a CD, but a dot dot, and then match the file name and then the file type. So this is how you're gonna read in your files. All right, so well, this is how you're gonna 
enumerate the files that you have or list the files that you have. Now, how are we going to read in the file contents? Well, we're going to do just a little bit of iteration here. So we're going to start with the empty file contents list for each of the files and the file names that we had. So for each of these, all we're going to do is we are going to open the file. And this is just a, I think it's called a context manager. I always call it the wrong thing. But basically, it's going to manage the opening and closing of the file. So when, after we read that, so this is going to be the specific file, we are going to append that to our list of file contents. And also a quick note here, this is, uh, uh, here, here we're sort of adding everything into memory all at once, but do know that if you have very large, you know, data, you don't necessarily need to load it all up at, at once. You might want to think about iterating through some of that. We ran into, had somebody who had a very large file and they said, well, I don't have memory. Well, you don't have to load it all at once. In this case, all this fits easily in memory. So this, this makes sense. Oh, that is such a good point. That is a great point. And also keep in mind, like you actually don't. So depending on exactly what you're doing, you don't even need to start out by loading all these things in at the same time. You can use the file path as the reference to the file and then read that in as your package requires it. This will come in handy with fast.ai as well. Yeah. Sir, I have a quick question. Um, so I'm. this is just about a few steps uh, before uh, when you are opening the PineUp uh, notebook in Google Colab, when I click on your GitHub link and then click on the uh, to um, dash drive, um, uh -huh. you know, that PineUp um, uh, notebook, it just opens it in GitHub instead of in Google Colab. Um, am so I missing sure? something? Yes, yeah, so make sure you click this button Oh, opening. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And then you can just- That's what I missed. <laughs> that was no problem. I wish I had a dollar for every time I did that. All right. Excellent. So let us know if you need any assistance in terms of mounting. Um, so again, you can just, you can pretty much run this directly through, but you just mount your drive. You follow the instructions that it gives you. So it'll be accessing a website giving an authorization, pasting that in, and then we're gonna be cloning this repo just so we can make sure that we have access to these files. Okay, all right, so now we have these files here. As Jesse said, we're, we're going to read these in, but this is not an overly necessary step if you have large data, so let's read those in. And we're just gonna take a brief glance at uh, file contents. So you don't see any output here because we didn't <laughs> output anything, but let's look at the file contents. So here, we're just printing the list. So this is the length of file contents first, and then we're just selecting out the first element to just take a quick look and see if things are making sense. So here we can just see the beginning of, of this file as well as the link. Okay, so then we are gonna read the tabular data. Again, we can reference exactly where this is in the Google Drive, right? So if you, again, if it's somewhere else, just reference it as you would if you were on your own computer um, and give it like maybe a relative file path or you can reference it directly. And so here we're just gonna read the CSV that we had and we're gonna take a brief look at it so we can run this one. So this is looking very similar to what we had before. Um, now we are just going to make this do, not this, but we're going to make the file names um, and the text into a data frame. And so this kind of just makes it easier for us to manipulate all of this information together. Um, just to kind of break down what this is doing, we're making a data frame, we're passing in this data structure, which is a dictionary. And so it's really easy to make dictionaries or make pandas data frames from dictionary. One of the columns is gonna be called file name. Basically what this thing is doing is it's taking the beginning of, uh, or actually the end, so the actual text file name. Um, and then this one is going to be a column of all the file contents. Um, lastly, we're going to make one additional column in this data frame um, that's going to be called article ID, and it's going to be the file name, um, but as an integer, so without that text part. So that was a lot of words. Let's see what that looks like. So keep in mind if you're on Windows, um, sometimes the split characters can be a little bit iffy. You might need to change this to be the other direction of the backslash, maybe backslash and a double backslash. So when to escape the backslash and then the backslash itself. Um, but here on Google Collab, we can just input this. 
Um, and so here we can see this uh, text file uh, data frame that we have made. We have the file name of the text. And again, that we did that using this. So basically it split off the workshop files part. Then we have the actual text corresponding to the file name. And then we have just the integer value of the file name because we can use this to join it with this table. So if we join these two things together, we'll have all the information about the author uh, with the college major um, with the text as well. And so one last time, just keep in mind, as Jesse said, we don't need to read in this text. We can uh, just use the file names or load them in at a later time. Here, we're gonna directly use the text. So let's just join those together. So we're just gonna take a look at the column names here just so we can decide what to join on. We know that article ID is matching this other article ID. And so we use pandas data frame merge method to merge those two together on the specific key. And we can just see what that looks like. We store it into the variable called DF. Okay, so this is just the head. So it's the first five um, rows, but we can see the full shape of it is 20, which matches our author CSV, as well as eight columns that we have here on our merge text. So we did all that. Those are things that you know you traditionally do in Python, particularly um, if you're trying to work with data frames and your text. Okay. So now we have everything we need. So we have all the text, right? We have all the text, and we're able to get it as a list, right? Now we need to get the sentiments for each of these, right? And we already imported pipeline. Wonder how we can use that pipeline to create a sentiment classifier and then get the results of classification by passing this in. I wonder how we can do this. So people who attended the Python workshop, you might have really great insight on how you can do this, um, but we're gonna just take three or four, or we're gonna take three minutes and on our own, we're gonna try to implement this. So what you're trying to do here again, is create a pipeline that sentiment analysis and then you're trying to generate the results so the positive and negative labels or perhaps a list of text using this data frame so we're going to take three or four minutes and work on that together and then we will code that up and keep moving so i'll stop sharing my screen so you can have the full expanse of your own screen too
All right, and we are back. Start sharing my screen again. Anybody come up with a solution? Please feel free to drop it in the chat. All right, someone says we should use pipeline and pass in sentiment analysis. That's sounding right. All right, so pipeline, and we want to do sentiment analysis. Then they said we can call that pipeline. So we're going to call this one sentiment classifier here. They call it analysis. We can use that. Should have used analysis too long to type okay and we're going to use full df so this thing here we're going to use the text column or we're just going to convert that to a list because as we discovered from the api before we're able to pass the list all right so let's run that as expected we download some things including models and tokenizers All right, looks like it's executed. Oh, it seems like, okay, so we didn't put anything out there. So let's look at that. So here we're going to, well, okay. So I'm gonna click this one, but I'm gonna click A to make a cell above it, just so we can take a look at sent results, just to see what we get, making sure that we get the results. All right, so, okay, we have just what we thought. So we have a list of dictionaries, corresponding to the labels and the scores for each of the different texts. Perfect. So now we're just going to create a data frame just for simplicity. So here we have the data frame and we are going to concatenate this together with the original data frame so we have everything together. And we can take a look at this here. Now something to keep in mind with concatenation, it concatenates along these axes here. So it's not just like one to one, it's one to axes, the, 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 sorry, index, the index, okay? All right, so fantastic. So we have actually achieved our objective, haven't we? So, well, sort of. So we have read in all of our data that we wanted. We performed some inference on our text and got the sentiments. And now we just need to do the rest of our analysis, right? So maybe we just wanna just take a look. So here are just a few analysis steps, like this is probably not the best analysis. It's just, you know, something. But it's just an example of what you might be able to do. So again, we have all this goodness. Actually, I think concatenate this was not the right thing. I think I would rather have this full DF. So here we go. So all I did there was I used um, the data frame with everything instead of just the author DF. It could be either, really, it doesn't matter. But we have uh, the label and the score with all of the previous information. And now we can just take a look at that. And uh, we're going to group by college major, look at specifically at the level uh, labels, so this. And then we're going to do a value counts and then do some things for plotting. So let's see. Oh my goodness. So now we have the sentiments that we can look at by college major. Uh, maybe we want to calculate an aggregate score. We can do that as well. Here, this is basically doing something similar, but it's just filling the NA with zero. And then if there were NA, and then we can plot uh, a differential. So it seems like uh, everyone's pretty negative, but uh, maybe pre-law and pre-med are neutral. So interesting, right? So let's, let's pause and consider your own applications. So if right now you were doing a sentiment analysis task and you had all of your text files in a Google Drive folder, you could use what we've talked about today to use Glob to get all of that information um, from your text files. And then you could use the pipeline to then do some kind of task on it and get results and analyze them. We have done here today. We have done a full analysis using real data. Woo, congratulations. So, right now, you are right there on the cusp. And so, we have given you some homework. If you are able to upload load your data to Google Drive, do try to do that tonight 
so that we can start to work together or in groups um, on your particular application tomorrow. So we'll have a little work session where you'll be able to focus on per performing your application as much as you're able to. Now, again, if you have data that you can't upload to the cloud, totally okay. Just install using Anaconda and we can also help you with that. Um, and make sure you're gonna make sure to install Hugging Face Transformers as well as the PyTorch um, backend or TensorFlow flow as you like. All right, are there any questions about this? So um, I have two questions. Uh, can we use a Vanderbilt box instead of Google Drive? Is that, you know, so because we uploaded all the image files for the particle analyzer, or should we transfer it to Google Drive? So, that's a very good question. So this one here, so Jesse, you may have more insight into this, but this one is just mounting the drive. I do not know if you can mount a box, but there are workarounds to be able to download a box directory um, as a zip file and then unzip it like here. Okay. So okay. there are workarounds, like, but I don't know, it kind of just kind of depends on your thoughts there. Okay, so, so probably it's better. And then the second question would be because we are working with images, can we also then uh, work with zip files or should we unzip everything? With zip files? So yes, yeah, so you would generally unzip things. Okay. Um, but, but always remember that we have that exclamation point. We have the exclamation point. So that allows us to do bash commands and there are bash commands to unzip. Okay. So you can always use that bash command, unzip it to a specific file. Also keep in mind that when you do, because we have those bash commands available to us, we can also curl things. So if you need to get yep. things from a specific location, you can also curl it. Or, or use wget. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. And there's there's also another one which which I just uh, just started to use, which is even uh, more general, more powerful. But but with those two, you ought to be able to get to it. But yes, moving moving the simplest way is to mount to mount that drive uh, off of off of a Google Drive. Um, that's that's the simplest, especially even if you just do a subset. So if, and one other note: if you have a very large data set, just use a small sample just to begin with. Um, especially with the images, because um, it's going to require sort of more more work since the that, that automatic pipeline isn't yet available for that. So you want to have it smaller, just to sort of experiment with uh, with running uh, that code uh, on that. Great questions. Any other questions? And I'll mention one more time, as we, as I mentioned at the very beginning of uh, the, the, the first hour before we got started, for those of you who are working with images, uh, Transformers is going to be a very promising way to take a look. But there is a more traditional way that's, that's found great success, and that's using models that are called convolutional neural nets. Uh, and we are, are happy to do uh, an additional uh, one hour workshop to get you started on those as well. There's terrific information on fast.ai on those. But we'll be happy to, uh, we'll, we'll touch base with you to, to get a good time. Uh, but, uh, but they're very powerful uh, APIs, just like we've talked here, very high level uh, for working with that, with that. So you, and the answer is you'll probably want to do both. Uh, so you can do the traditional, and then you can do the sort of the state of the art with, with transformers. But you need the traditional, especially if you want to publish. People are going to say, well, why not use the CNN? Because, well, I did, and I use transformer. Here's which one worked best. All right. All right, fantastic. So I think we're going to end a little bit earlier, early today. Don't want to start out on the next part. You can start that tomorrow. Um, but don't forget to try to do your homework tonight. Try to get things on Google Drive if you can, or access um, however you feel that would be most helpful for your workflow. Um, and we will see you tomorrow. Jesse, and sure, I have a question. It looks like uh, Yushan has segmented our, our images. 
Ooh. The box is filling up massively. Ooh. Fantastic. Okay. That is great. I mean, there, um, there are probably ten, tens of thousands of images. Yes. I, I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Should I download a, a subsample? More yes oh yes yeah yeah subsample yeah, okay. yeah yeah just yeah just 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 a subsample yeah okay um well if you check in there probably shouldn't be tens of thousands but we'll we'll figure it out oh I, I have no idea I just I'm just it's it's filling as we're speaking it's actually running yes cur currently yes. so like oh gosh ah, okay. <laughs> that is very exciting but but they look good I mean the the uh, the, the examples are very shirt like in terms of the uh, yes. yeah oh I'm so like, excited. I can I can share my my screen. Oh, and Sahar, while you're pulling up your screen, Sahar, were you uh, able to sort of get uh, get caught up a little bit? And you can watch the video uh, from yesterday as well. But do let us know if you have any questions. All right. Sure, will do. Thank you so much. So the video will be uh, where where the video will be. Um... Oh, okay. That is. Uh, let's see. I will put it in chat. Um, and I think I emailed it to give me one moment. Oh, okay. Yes, you emailed me something. So then that's yes. for the for this session. Yes, it'll be on the it'll be on the go it'll be on the YouTube channel. Okay. Um, where is my? Yes, and I'll put it in. I'll put it in chat too, just so you can have it. This is a link to our YouTube channel. We ought to get a better name for our YouTube channel. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Great. There you go. Perfect. So the, the videos of the previous workshop on Python is also there, right? That's correct. Except for Fridays, so I've got to, I've got to dig up Fridays and, and get that one processed. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much. See you awesome. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Not sure if you're able to see that. Yes. So yeah, that's just, great. Yeah, they're they're really um, coming together. Nice. Oh, fantastic. And the names, but, do you, did she do with the names? That, yes, she did. Check yeah, that out. That dash 79, dash 60. Those are the percentages. Click on the dash 99. Yes. Yeah, percent white. Okay. Yeah, very. It worked. Okay. That is a 54. 69. I'm wondering how it's doing it because that's. Oh, 79% white, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, gotcha, right. Yep. Great, okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, but, as, but as you can see, it's uh, the cursor here. It's, uh, that's it's, it. Pretty, She's <laughs> running it right now. <laughs> yes, they're, they're, they're going up. That's so cool. <laughs> Great, okay. Well, how many should I download, do you think? Oh, you know, really just like a couple of dozen. Okay. You know, okay. just so you can just, you can always add more. But what you right. don't want to do is like, oh, I've loaded, you know, I've waited five minutes for them all to load. Now I'm out of memory or I've waited 20 minutes for them to load. Oh, and I made a mistake. You know what I mean? Ah, so you just want to have like a really small so you can iterate through. And then when you, if you want to really, really do it, great. Then you load them all, just rerun, you know, and then go to bed and come back. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and for you, you might want to think about, definitely make sure that you select the GPU and perhaps think about doing, um, uh, if you want to sort of do it in Google Colab, you might want to think about doing the ten dollars a month because uh, you, right. you, you get a higher level GPU and more memory. Okay. Cool. But and of course you'll be able to run all this, you know, on on Acre and others. But this sort of gets it to you like immediately. Okay. Cool. We'll have to walk me through that one, but yeah, it's it's great that it seemed to come in. Thanks again for all of your help today. No problem. See you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And so hard. Did you have a no? Oh, and you're gone. <laughs> This is great, Charles. This is amazing. Go us, go team. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of empowering people, like to do things, I don't think that we have ever done a more powerful session than today's session. Oh, wow. Think about it: what they were capable of before ten o'clock today, and what they're capable of now at noon. You you have. That's mind blowing. It's very exciting. I'm happy for them, but I'm also happy for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh yeah. Uh, all right. I'll see you all. All right. See you. Bye. See you.